going to be in the Old Testament probably over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to read some from Joshua. Today I'm in Joshua 7, and this is from the World English Bible. Joshua 7, starting in verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. Therefore, God's anger burned against the children of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Aden on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the land. The men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Don't let all the people go up, but let only about two or three thousand men go up and strike Ai. Don't make all the people to toil there, for there are only a few of them. So about 3,000 men of the people went up there, and they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck about 36 of them, and they chased them from before the gate, even to Shebarim, and struck them at the descent. The hearts of the people melted and became like water. Unfortunately, we all experience failure from time to time. James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Some have a much better batting average than others, to use a baseball term. Sometimes we fail in our work or at home or school or socially, and sometimes morally and spiritually. But what I want to talk about is how to deal redemptively with our failures. And we can get some powerful help from Joshua chapter 7. Joshua and his army, they're confident from defeating the city of Jericho. They decided to go up and do battle against the people of Ai, a little city that's located not far away. However, to their surprise, they got crushed and chased all the way home. I've told some of you this story. I had a friend growing up that would always get us in fights. And by us, I mean me. Because he would start the fights and then he would run. One of my earliest childhood memories is of him starting a fight that we were outnumbered five to two in and then he took off running for home. And the whole way home, while guys are chasing him, he's looking over his shoulder and he's yelling, chickens, chickens, the whole way home. So that's what this was like in AI. They were chased all the way home. In Joshua 7, 5 and 6, we read, and the men of AI smoked of them about 30 and 6, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. They had been beaten and humiliated. But they dealt with their failure redemptively, and we can do the same. First of all, God reminded them that failure need not be final. If we jump ahead to Joshua 8.1, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. God said the first time you didn't get the job done, but this time you're going to succeed. The first time you failed, but failure need not 
be final. Sometimes we fail at something because it wasn't something we should have attempted to start with. And often God uses a failure to steer us in an entirely different direction where we can find success. Many such examples could be given. However, sometimes even when we are on the right road, we fail. When that happens to you, I want to encourage you not to give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give in to despair because there is still hope for success. Failure need not be final. You may have burned certain bridges so that the book has to be closed on those situations. But the point is, the next time around, as you deal with a similar situation, you can prevail. Failure need not be final. There are many biblical characters, such as Abraham, Simon Peter, John Mark that we read about in our morning scripture, who failed but later succeeded, and you can do the same. I have heard this same chapter preached about and taught on over and over in my life, and it is usually the hellfire and damnation version of this that you hear. But this is a story of redemption. Here is a story that many of you will know. In the 1800s, there was a young man in Illinois. He ran for the state legislature and was badly beaten. He next entered business and failed and spent 17 years of his life paying off the debts of his unethical partner. He was in love with a young woman, became engaged to her, and then she died. Later, he married a woman who was a constant burden to him, but he was faithful to her. It sounds like a country song at this point. Entering politics again, he ran for Congress and again was badly defeated. He then tried to get an appointment to the United States Land Office staff and failed. He became a candidate for the United States Senate and was soundly defeated again. In 1856, he became a candidate for the vice presidency, but was defeated by Frederick Douglass. One failure after another, many of them major setbacks. Yet he kept on believing that failure need not be final. And as we all know, that man, Abraham Lincoln, in 1860, became the 16th president of the United States, and his memory is revered by people all over the world. The hard part about failure is picking yourself up. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Wait a minute, wait a minute. A just man falls seven times? Are you kidding? Then what is it that makes him a just man? The fact that he got up. I have read scripture after scripture since I've been here, just like this one today, to Elijah under the juniper tree, to the cripple that Christ healed. One of the things that we are told by God over and over again is to get back up. If you're crossing a freeway and you trip and you fall in the street, you wouldn't lay there and say, woe is me, I've fallen down. There's no point in going on, my life ends here. No, that's not what you do at all. You jump up. You do that quick look of shame to see if anybody saw you fall down and they're laughing at you. And then you get out of the road before you get hit by a car and really hurt. Then you go on about your day. Life is just the exact same way. If you lay there in your failures and in your sin, Satan is heading your way with a whole semi-truck full of destruction. And I promise he's not blowing the horn for you either. So you need 
to get up. But again, the hard part can be how. Not only did God remind Joshua and the Israelites that failure need not be final, God also showed them how to get back up. And what worked for them will also work for you and me. How do you move from failure to victory? You get rid of the sin in the camp. If we look at the first essential, following the defeat at Ai, Joshua fell on his face before God in despair. But in Joshua 7, 10, and 11 we read, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. In verse 12 God said, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs. Then in verse 13, God said, Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel. There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from before you. In the remainder of chapter 7, we learn that they found the culprit, a soldier named Achan, had stolen and hidden some forbidden items from the Jericho battle site, and his family had aided and abetted him. Because Achan and his family had contaminated the whole camp of Israel, had caused a crushing defeat to his nation, and had caused the death of 36 soldiers, God commanded that capital punishment be administered. Let that marinate for a while. Once that sentence of death was carried out, thereby removing the stain from their midst, throw that in the marinade, Joshua and his people were clean and ready to make a new beginning. So the first step in moving from defeat to victory is to get rid of the sin in the camp. Not every failure in life is traceable to sin, certainly. But often sin is the cause, or at least one of the causes. In this instance, Achan was the culprit. But when sin is a factor in our failure, we are the culprit. And so we should always start by searching our own hearts. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 begins with these words. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 we read, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Psalm 31.10 acknowledged, My strength faileth because of my iniquity. Over and over the Bible makes it clear, I cannot believe people don't see, that in order to be victorious in life's battles, God's soldiers have to be clean. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No soldier on duty entangles himself in the affairs of life, that he may please him who enrolled him as a soldier. So that's the first essential in dealing redemptively with our failures. We need to examine our hearts to be sure that we faced up to any sin in our lives that caused our failure. Lamentations 3.40 says, Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. And here is the wonderful promise that we read in Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The second thing that's closely related to what we've already noted, God pointed out to Joshua why he and his army had failed. It is crystal clear that Joshua took to heart what God showed him. In other words, 
Joshua and his people learned from their failure. It is obvious that they did because the next time they marched against the city of Ai, they were victorious. There is a giant hole in the earth over at a disc golf course in Oregon called Clark Park. When we were there, we called it the Bear Trap. It's right at the edge of the course. And when the grass isn't freshly cut, you can't see it. And the way I found it was by throwing a really good disc golf shot while I was talking to a guy sitting there on the bench. And as I walked up the field, I was still looking at the guy, not at the ground, right up until the time I heard my ankle make that funny popping sound and I found myself face down in the dirt. Now this is cool, so you need to listen. We played golf at Clark Park hundreds of times after that day. I never stepped in that hole again. Not even once. I knew where it was. I knew when it was coming up. I recalled the pain when I stood there on the tee pad. After I got up, I went and showed the hole to my family to make sure that they didn't fall in it. I may break my leg on another hole or on another course, but when it comes to that old bear trap, I had learned from my mistakes. We are reminded by Israel's experience that it is God's will that we should first get up from our failures, but also that we should learn from our failures. David Cawson tells a story that many are familiar with. He's an evangelist, but it will bear repeating. At Laney High School in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1978, there was a 15-year-old boy who yearned to be on the school's varsity basketball team but he just wasn't good enough. He couldn't make the grade. He simply didn't demonstrate the necessary skills. For one thing, he had a poor shot. He had a hard time hitting the basket. So no one was surprised when this skinny little kid didn't make the team. What did surprise folks was the way the boy responded. Instead of sulking or giving up, he set out to correct his mistakes and to develop the skills he needed. He spent endless hours in the gym, often by himself, day after day, month after month. Finally, that little boy, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, became one of the greatest basketball players the world has ever seen. He finally succeeded because he was determined to learn from his failures on the court. We also can learn from our failures in the moral and spiritual realm. Edgar A. Guest, who is a poet, he wrote, one broken dream is not the end of dreaming. One shattered hope is not the end of all. Beyond the storm and tempest stars are gleaming, Still plant your castles, though your castles fall. Though many dreams come tumbling in disaster, though pain and heartache meet you down the years, still cling to faith, your secret fears still master, and strive to learn a lesson from your tears. The third thing, and this also is closely related to what's already been said, but deserves a separate mention, so here it is. In your next attempt, follow God's instructions. In their first attempt against AI, there is no indication whatsoever that Joshua and the people sought God's guidance. You know, it's because they were so pumped up from their victory over Jericho that they were overconfident. They started painting without a drop cloth, as they say because they were so good. And they set out strictly on their own, and the result, of course, 
was disastrous. But now, this second time around, Joshua knows better than to charge off like gangbusters without seeking God's guidance. He has lost an ankle in the bear trap, and he had not fallen in that again. This time, he waits on the Lord, and he listens as God speaks. And we read later in Joshua 8, 2, the Lord said to Joshua, And thou shalt do to Ai and her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king, only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. In the next several verses, God elaborated on those instructions. He gave them the details as to how many shoulders, soldiers were to be in different locations and when and how they were to implement, uh, implement the various parts of this plan. And Joshua and his troops carried out those instructions to the letter. And bear in mind, this was not a slaughter of innocent people, but the judgment of God upon an evil and depraved society that had long resisted God's grace and truth. In verses 26 and 27 we read, For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the cattle and the spoil of that city took Israel for prey unto themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he commanded Joshua. So Joshua and his soldiers had failed previously, but this time they faithfully followed God's instructions. If you and I would win where previously we had failed, we must seek and carefully follow God's instructions. Where do we find those instructions? In, the, in God's Word, in the Scripture, in our Bible. Those instructions are then confirmed through prayer and sometimes the counsel of a godly person that God places in our lives. Sometimes God will cause circumstances to converge so as to indicate His will. Sometimes He uses a combination of all these things, but if we seek His will with deep earnestness, He will reveal it. Finally, the fourth essential for dealing redemptively with our failures, having confessed any sin that was involved in your failure and having learned from your failures and having sought and found God's guidance, this time, give it all you've got. Remember what happened the first time. Joshua and his troops set out to conquer Ai. Joshua, without checking with the Lord, followed the advice of his scouts who thought Ai would be a pushover and it wasn't deserving of an all-out effort. So they sent only a small fighting force and we've seen defeat was the result. The soldiers were driven back and fled, but now as they prepared for their second attempt to conquer Ai, God said in Joshua 8, 1, take all the people of war with thee. In other words, God was saying, this time, give it all you've got. And so it is with you and me. If we would move from failure to victory, we must pour our all into whatever God leads us to. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, we read, Whatsoever their hand, thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Colossians 3.23 says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. After a concert, the famed violinist Fritz Chrysler, a fan, rushed up and said, I give my whole life to be able to play like you do. To which Chrysler replied, I did. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army and was used of God to reach multitudes of the down and out of London for Christ. In 1909, when Booth was 80 years of age, 
American evangelist J. Wilbur Chapman asked him the secret of his success. Dr. Chapman, telling later of that conversation with William Booth, said this. He hesitated a second, and I saw tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities, but from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was to have. And if there's anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Dr. Chapman said that he went away from that meeting with William Booth knowing that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. So no matter how far we've fallen, no matter how bloody we are from battle, no matter the enormity of our failure, we can, by the grace of God, move from failure to victory. If we'll go about it God's way, if we'll surrender ourselves to Christ and then follow the same steps that Joshua felt followed in dealing with his defeat, that's how we can deal redemptively with our failures. Guys, I thank you for listening to me this morning.